Okay, there we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Healthy Teen Networks Google Hangout on U360 in Action. We are going to begin today with a little bit of an introduction from our president and CEO, Pat Paluzzi, and then she will turn it over to our two presenters who are joining us today. They will talk a little bit about what their agencies are doing to act put U360 into action, and then we will open it up for a question and answer session. On the side of your screen, you have an option to enter in comments in the live chat. Feel free to enter anything in as we go along. Uh, we will be moderating the questions here on our end, and we will hold them until each of our guests has had a chance to present. Uh, but then the rest of the time, we welcome uh, your questions, and this is an opportunity for just open discussion, very informal. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, Pat, I am going to turn it over to you. When you see that green bar on your screen, you'll know that you're on. To try. Uh, about five or six years ago, Healthy Teen Network adopted what a holistic, ecological approach to promoting positive sexual and reproductive health for our teens and young adults. We have branded this Youth 360. It is based on demands from the field to begin to incorporate the social determinants of health so that we can begin to address some of the disparity in health and equity gaps that we see that persist um, across many, many uh, public health indicators and uh, teen pregnancy and teen parenting not exclusive of that. Uh, we believe that, um, that promoting this model requires uh, new partners, uh, new approaches, new thoughts. We're very excited to see as people try it. That's what we're very excited to hear today from uh, two agencies that have really embraced this idea and they're putting it into play in their agencies. Uh, we also look forward to hearing from all of you about what you think of this as a model as you hear more about it today. And finally, the one other thing that I would like to say is that we've decided to do this Google Hangout in the month of May, which is traditionally known as Teen Pregnancy Prevention Month. And part of thinking about um, this U360 frame is to start to reframe how we talk about teen pregnancy and teen parenting so that we can come from a more positive view that doesn't um, intentionally or unintentionally malign teens who then become parents, become pregnant or parenting. And so we like to think of things as more from a health promotion model, which is what U360 does. So we'd also like to hear your opinions on that as we continue in our, in our session today. But now I'm going to turn it over to our pr two presenters. They are Lizette Torres, who's with the Alexandria Campaign to Prevent Teen Pregnancy, and Stephanie Campbell, who's with the Massachusetts Department of Health, Division of Sexual Health and Youth Development. So thank you to them, and thank you to all who joined us. Look forward to our conversation. Gina, do you turn it over to somebody? Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry for the delay. Um, we were just making sure that everyone could see, and it looked like there was a delay in the live stream. Um, and I'm just waiting from combination from Kelly before we move on to our guest. You'll just hang tight with us. I'm sorry for the delay.
Sorry about that. We are just making sure that everyone can see and hear. I know that there are some technical difficulties. Please bear with us. We did do a lot of testing, but it never fails that no matter how prepared you think you are, you aren't. <laughs> Stephanie, I'm going to try to turn on your camera and see if we can show your video, um, just see if that makes a difference with a different account that you turned in. But I wanted to give you a heads up before I turned it over to share you. Um, we're just trying to work through this. And so there is a little bit of delay in the live stream. So Stephanie, I'm just waiting to see if you appear. And then I can say that I'm unmuted. And so there it is. OK. I don't know what just happened. OK. I didn't do anything different. Oh, well, they can hear us now talking. About it. <laughs> hey, everybody. <Hi>. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> OK, um, let's see if I can successfully turn it over to Stephanie, and we will see if that works. <laughs> Stephanie, I believe I have unmuted you, and I believe that you are sh showing. Um, if you just give it a few seconds, I'll wait and okay. see if it shows up. There you are. And I'm just waiting for confirmation that people can hear you as well from our staff support. Stephanie, if you, Stephanie, if you can test speaking, please. Good afternoon. Could you hear me? I'm waiting for confirm. I, I can hear you on my end. I'm waiting for confirmation that they can hear you.
Okay, great. Stephanie, we are good to go. Um, so go ahead. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Stephanie Campbell and I work at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Um, and as you know, in state government and public health in particular, we're in bureaus and divisions, et cetera. Um, I'm in the Bureau of Community Health and Prevention and I sit in the Office of Sexual Health and Youth Development. I'm excited to be on here this afternoon to talk a little bit about how we've embraced the Youth 360 model. Recently, this past spring in March, we had the opportunity to re-procure our state funding around teen pregnancy prevention. This is a line item that we've had in Massachusetts for over 20 years, um, and it, hasn't been re it has not been re-procured in the past 10 years, and that's just the process that we use to distribute our state funds. So it was an opportunity to really embrace some of the best practices that has happened in the field in the past 10 years, as well as an opportunity to reframe the issue. Um, so our program no longer is called Teen Pregnancy Prevention here in Massachusetts, so I'm super excited about that. We are now referred to as the Adolescent Sexuality Education Program. And one of the reasons um, why I'm super excited about the Youth360 model, because it's an opportunity for us to expand our work beyond the individual level intervention. In particular, many of our partners have begun to straddle along the different levels as um, HTN has identified. So relationships, community, and society. But how do we begin to be more strategic? So in terms of a systemic or institutional shift here in Massachusetts, the framework was included in our most recent RFR. Um, and we just literally this week, so I'm a little pooped between Tuesday and Thursday, I've announced to each of the grantees who was awarded and how much. And so we're at the infancy of beginning this work and our partners are excited that we've had a reframe um, and a really a focus on how do we expand youth opportunities. And um, that's the gist of what I'll share now until we get into questions. Hello, everyone. Um, again, thank you for bearing with us. Stephanie, thank you for that. Um, we are going to mm -hmm. turn it over to Lisette Torres now. Lisette, just give me a second to make sure that you're up on the screen and that we can hear you before you begin, um, just so that we don't miss anything um, that you're gonna share. Okay, Lisette, if you can test speaking and just make sure that we can hear you. Good afternoon, everyone. Just waiting a second for the um, the live stream to catch up. Make sure I can see you. I'm not seeing you yet on the other end, so I just want to make sure that that works. Okay, Kelly could hear you but not see you yet. Let's see. I am very sorry, everyone, for these difficulties. I'm not sure what the bug is going on. And um, I promise you, we did try to test this multiple times. All right, I know that I came up. Lisette, there you are. Okay, great. Um, so I am very sorry for the delay. I don't know why there's some kind of delay with the controls. Um, 
Pat and Steph, uh, Pat and Stephanie, I am not going to mute you or turn off your camera because there does seem to be something funny in turning you on and off. Um, so just be aware of that. But Lisette, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, I want to thank Pat and Gina and the Healthy Teen Network for um, hosting this Google Hangout and just giving us um, Stephanie and I an opportunity to share a little bit about the work that we're doing. Um, so uh, I'm with the Alexandria Campaign um, on Adolescent Pregnancy. We are in the city of Alexandria, Virginia, just on the other side of the river um, from Washington, D.C. Um, Alexandria is a very unique community. Um, we have sort of that small town community feel, but we're very much an urban community and urban environment in terms of our population, um, sort of how densely populated we are. Um, and so um, we are a community coalition. We're funded and operating under the city of Alexandria, so within, within the city government, uh, the Department of Community and Human Services, and we're housed within the Youth Development and Prevention Team or Division. Um, so we have a very strong focus on youth development overall based on kind of where we are and who um, our team is. Um, we have been around as a coalition since the year 2000, um, successfully implementing evidence-based programs and practices, as many of you um, are doing as well. Um, however, despite our success and our uh, our successes in declining teen pregnancy rate, we still have gaps in terms of um, the segments of our population that are disproportionately affected by teen pregnancy, um, poverty, low achievement, and just overall poor health outcomes. And so this is something that we as a community started to look at very closely um, kind of over the past five years um, within that kind of same time frame that Healthy Teen Network um, was working on the, the U360 framework. Um, so we're, we're very lucky um, to operate within a network of agencies and community groups and organizations that were already talking about social determinants of health. Um, and this, when we started this work, um, it was sort of a very strong planning period for our community. There were a couple of large community-wide um, plans that were um, starting to kind of take shape, and there was a lot of work being done in those areas. So in terms of sort of the timing and the momentum around the social determinants, um, this was this was really sort of prime for us. And so we were lucky to have that kind of um, community support and just the movement around the, the social determinants. Um, and so there was a, a community health improvement plan that was being formed. Um, and, and we made sure to have a seat at the table for a couple of reasons. One, to ensure that our work would be incorporated and the outcomes that we were looking to achieve would be incorporated into the plan. And two, to just better align ourselves with other health initiatives within the city, um, because um, this is a, a plan that was recognized and adopted by the city council. So there was sort of some um, uh, political support behind it. And then in addition to adolescent health, the plan addresses um, access to care, housing, transportation, nutrition, physical health, um, just among sort of other sort of health issues that we, we wanted to closely align with. And then um, at around that same time, as I mentioned, this was sort of a very heavy planning period for the city of Alexandria. Um, our city's Children, Youth and Families Collaborative Commission, which is a city appointed um, commission, it's like an advisory group, um, uh, was working on a citywide children and youth master plan. So this was a plan that focused kind of more comprehensively on ensuring that Alexandria's youth were prepared to become healthy adults by the age of 21. So in addition to sort of the health and well-being piece that we fit into, um, the plan focuses heavily on building resilience among youth, um, mental health, educational attainment, um, supports for families, and it utilizes our developmental assets as um, key indicators for the plan. So again, another place where we wanted to make sure to have a seat at, at the table, and this is another sort of um, city council approved and recognized plan. Um, and then sort of more internally as an organization, we started to look at our work and identify um, some of the gaps that we had and, and look at some of the health equity issues related to teen pregnancy, um, looking more closely at root causes and um, just some of the relationships and the intersections um, of you know, some of the work that we were doing and other kind of broader issues in the community. Um, we started to talk about policy level changes that were needed for us to really be able to move the needle on teen pregnancy. So the momentum was really building at this time. Um, 
And so shortly after we started to have these discussions, Healthy Teen Na Network launched the U360 initiative, which really gave us the exact language and framework that we needed that we were looking for um, to be able to kind of roll this out in the community um, from kind of our per place and perspective. Um, so one of the first sort of exercises that we started with was to look at the concentric circles that many of us are very familiar with as a part of the U360 framework. And we started to sort of map our initiatives, our strategies and activities within that framework um, to get a better sense of um, sort of where we stand, where we were focusing our efforts, how we were doing our work. And then this also facilitated conversations about um, who else we might need to work with and partner with to accomplish things that some of sort of the higher levels, which are a little bit harder to achieve, but where we would see greater impact. Um, and, and then right around this time, we were also getting ready to update our strategic plan as we were sort of mapping things out. And so we were very excited to have the framework. Um, we asked um, Pat to come out um, on behalf of the Healthy Teen Network to provide a community workshop on U360. We were just really excited to share this with our partners, to share this with the community. That we finally sort of had the language to be able to, to talk about this in a way that we felt um, people could really connect with. Um, and you know, the other thing that was great about U360 is sort of in talk in the marketing aspect of it, um, we already had a campaign, a youth-led um, kind of a multimedia campaign called the Keep It 360 campaign. So in terms of how that fit together, it was perfect and our stakeholders there's really connected and familiarity um, and so it was it was it was easy for us to kind of get the buy-in um, and so Pat came out and she facilitated this workshop and also launched our um, action planning process so we had a great discussion um, about sort of the work that we were doing, things that we wanted to do, um, what we wanted to achieve. And so we really utilized the U360 framework as um, kind of the foundation for how we would um, do our work moving forward. Um, so that's kind of how we kicked it off. And then from there started to develop several initiatives um, that were included in our action plan, some things that we've already been successful in, some areas where we've already seen accomplishments, and then a lot of work that is still um, under underway for us. Thank you, Lisette. I'm going to transition to me, and I'm going to hope it's going to work, but I am not going to hold us up because it seems like the audio is working regardless. Um, I know that because of the, the issues at the beginning, we missed our president and CEO, Pat Paluzzi, her introduction. And so I'd like, Pat, um, to go back to you and just Explain a little bit about where we're coming from with, with U360 and why U360. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Thanks, Gina. Uh, well, again, Stephanie and Lisette, thanks so much for sharing your experiences. It's very, it's very satisfying for us to hear how this is being embraced and used in the field. Um, it was probably about six years ago when we were doing a new strategic plan that we uh, decided to do a broad reach across uh, and interview many of the uh, key players in the field or outside of the field slightly, but people who thought about these things and ask them what they thought we should be concentrating on moving forward. And the social determinants of health came up over and over again. And it made absolute sense to us because in the field, we know that pregnancy and birth rates have fallen consistently over the past several years are at an all-time low in this country. And we know that's been true for all racial and ethnic groups, but we also know that, that the gaps have not closed across those lines. And so we knew that we needed to expand our thinking and our approach. And that, the, that if we think of what we do as a health equity issue, then thinking in terms of having to address some of the social determinants of health makes absolute sense. So we embraced that concept. We eventually, um, found the social ecological health promotion model, which uh, most exemplified what we were trying to do and we came up with a brand new more simplified model to make it a little, maybe a little more digestible in the field and began to promote that. Um, and uh, so now we are at the phase where we're trying to understand more and more. So what does it actually mean to do you 360? And that's why today is so exciting. And I, and I hope to hear um, more from others, questions or, or you know, I, I want to add a couple of comments if I could to um, to highlight a 
one thing each with Stephanie and Lizette. And when Stephanie mentioned that they now use the U360 frame in their call for proposals for their bids from the people that they would offer grants to, that's a lovely systematic way to then get the field to think about and across a broad spectrum of your agencies to be moving in the same direction. So that is a really, that was a great um, approach and one that I think others could think about. And then for Lizette, I wanted to point out things like joining my health improvement plan and some of these other groups that they themselves into because one of the things that we want to do is we want to move forward the frame that teen pregnancy prevention is health promotion mm -hmm. and that it's part of the overall health of young people and of our nation really and that um, we don't need to shy away from adolescent sexual reproductive health because they're part of a bigger a bigger aim that we have for young people so i, I really want to just point out those two particular pieces um, that I heard today. Maybe that'll get us started. Thank you, Pat. Uh, so I think that one of the, the things that we hear a lot too is, is this buy-in and getting started and, and having pushback. But Lisa, you mentioned you had a great amount of support from the beginning and you, before even thinking about U360, you were approaching it from the youth development youth development and the assets approach and your community was really primed. Why do you think that was? What's so unique um, about Alexandria? I mean, you know, my experience in Alexandria, I've been here for five years and it's a community that really, um, that really comes together um, for shared goals, shared objectives. And so um, although we do have some silos that exist, I think overall the, the different kind of key players in the community, all the way up from our political, you know, our elected official city council members, um, you know, to the people who are on the ground kind of doing the work. Um, folks are really willing to work together, to be at the table together. Um, so that really helped to kind of create a lot of the momentum. Um, and I think it's what, um, you know, if you, if you have that kind of, um, those kind of circumstances in place, I think that's, that's a really kind of great way to get started, to just have the opportunity to be at the table with um, different people who are representing different sectors, different interests. Um, I think, I think that's a really great opportunity. And so that's sort of been our strategy. Um, you know, I like to joke that we sort of insert ourselves into everything, every opportunity we get, every sort of work group, every um, community wide plan. Um, we're just sort of there trying to first, um, you know, really listening to what people are doing, trying to, and then, you know, making connections and then helping to people to better understand the work we do and how it extends, as, as Pat was saying, sort of far beyond teaching kids about condoms and contraceptives, but, but our work is really kind of encompassing everything that um, makes a young person healthy and makes, you know, how helps them to succeed in life in the future, in their careers, in their education. And so that's really the conversation that we're having. And so, um, you know, we, we talk about, we use the framework and talk about it often and try to use the language to help people feel comfortable with it, to help people sort of connect with it. We print um, some messaging or the concentric circles on the backs of our agendas. We um, sort of indoctrinate everybody um, that we work with um, with this sort of framework. Um, our, any new board members who come on board are, are um, in their um, sort of introductory meetings um, and orientations there, we talk about it. With the youth that we work with, we help them to sort of understand this framework and why it's important. Um, so we, we talk about it a lot everywhere that we are and, and we try to sort of be everywhere. And that's that's hard to do, it takes time, but I think it's really important. And I, you know, I like to say that if I spend the majority of my day in meetings and groups and collaborating with folks outside of teen pregnancy, then I've had a, a very successful day because we're working on building those connections. Um, and um, I think that's really the key to, to accomplish what we want to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lisa. And I think we hear that a lot from um, our members and that, that establishing and maintaining the relationships, it takes time, but that that is such a very important part of the process. Uh, we do have a, a question. Uh, if any, either of you can offer any tips or tricks to incorporate U360 into the work of a youth advisory council. And 
None of you, are, no one is muted. So oh. um, I know we practiced it with muting and I would call out, but um, I'm not gonna mess with those controls since they seem to be a little bit funny. Um, but either, anyone who wants to, to chime in, go ahead. Um, I think in terms of a youth advisory council introducing the concept, it's a nice way to pull together all of your work in particular, particularly if you have organizations, some folks may be focused on youth development, some folks may be focused on health or violence prevention. Um, I think having something that's simple to say, like Youth 360, um, is easy buy-in. Most of us know and believe that um, our interventions is one piece of the puzzle um, and that it really requires these additional circles and strategies to be implemented. We also use it um, in our state partnership with our Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to really highlight the roles the social determinants of health play across um, young people's lives. One um, activity that we've done that, that we picked up at probably one of the conferences or trainings that we attended was to create sort of a fictional youth um, and different sort of scenarios and circumstances within this young person's life and then um, sort of map them or place them within the um, the concentric circles of framework and then have a conversation about that about all of these sort of interactions the intersections and I think it's a really sort of practical hands-on way to help young people um, understand the concept and sort of even see themselves um, within this and see um, sort of the impact that that they could have. Thank you both. And, and something that you've both mentioned in your in your discussions, the importance of talking and explaining this this concept and the messaging and how you talk about it and when you've got new board members or, or continuing board members the education with board members and staff members and i know we went through a similar process at healthy teen network um, dating back to our strategic plan and, and how do we talk about this and i'm saying it's, it's social ecological theory and and how do we make that easy to understand because once you do start breaking it down people do seem to um it, it makes a lot of sense, obviously. Have you, do you have any tips or lessons learned in, in trying to make uh, this idea more digestible or more accessible to your board members or your funders or your community members? Either Lizette or Stephanie? Your supervisors mm -hmm. or your staff? Mm -hmm. I mean, we started, uh, we, we started the conversations at sort of the very kind of basic level and talk in with our board um, particularly and we developed some um, messaging um, about sort of why this why this work matters sort of getting to the why not delving into kind of the the, the process or sort of the, the strategies but really thinking about why this matters and some messages that really resonated um, with with our board members and then with the broader community that, that they said we're going to start with this and really help people to connect with this in a personal way um, were you know phrases that we're familiar with like it takes a village or these are our kids and so helping people to understand sort of um, their own individual responsibility in this um, in this matter responsibility for the health and well-being of young people um, and then you know kind of taking it out as a community that was very successful for us I think that's something that people really kind of connected with that yeah this is an issue that affects all of us this matters this is our community these are our kids and then from there we were sort of able to open the conversations to sort of then how do we how do we do this what what do we know what do we need to do um, but we started kind of at the very sort of um, very sort of foundational like why does this matter to people if i may pat you're i'm putting you up to everyone go ahead great so i was thinking about a couple of things that i think can help make this more palatable and more a more understandable and b can maybe if you want to take it out of the sexual and reproductive health realm a little bit to get people to kind of think about it because i think sometimes um, the rub for some people is that are we, uh, are we removing individual responsibility out of the whole thing? And I think that that can um, be a barrier sometimes. So for one thing, I think that the, uh, an example I use often when thinking about um, this, this approach to uh, addressing health issues and thinking about the health equity piece is to take something like childhood obesity. Um, because childhood obesity is uh, something that we could say, well, you know, children, if they were taught to eat right, 
that sh and, and exercise more, that should take care of it. And they have responsibility for not eating whatever they're eating, too many chips, too much soda, whatever. But if you start thinking about childhood obesity and changing that behavior, it's pretty obvious right off the bat that the family has to have access to good food. They have to, ha um, which means grocery stores and just good food is in reach to them. They have the economic resource, the travel, whatever it is they need to get it. They have the resources to cook it and prepare it. They're home at meal times. They can model the behavior. And, you know, community supports it, et cetera, et cetera. It's not something that an individual can change. So sometimes introducing this concept, taking, removing it from sex helps. But then I think that's an easy transition when we, if we keep it in the equity frame, if we talk about equity because access being one of the key aspects of equity, even when you're then talking about sexual and reproductive health, not all young people have access to the same information and services that are needed to make choice about your behavior and to be informed about what your options are and to learn how to negotiate and, to, and all the things that are part and parcel of what go into our individual behavior, which is all framed then, of course, in the things that surround us. Thank you, Pat. So, Stephanie, I know uh, coming from a, a government agency, that can make things different. From your perspective, do you have any lessons learned or thinking about, um, uh, we hear sometimes that there are more challenges working within a government agency. What would you say to people thinking about it in, in terms of that or facing some, some of those similar challenges? I think that um, being in a government agency, the framework is an opportunity for two things. One, um, often the way that um, we provide services is very siloed, right? We have our adolescent sexuality education program, then we have violence prevention, then we have tobacco cessation, and the list goes on. And all of these are um, health outcomes or indicators that are impacting young people. And Youth 360 um, internally has been one way for all of us to sit at the same table and speak the same language, right? Tobacco has been more successful, I would say, when I think about um, some of the campaigns that have been out around young people to stop smoking in terms of environmental strategies, and what can we learn from them? So I'm super excited um, where I sit, one, to do an institutional shift um, in our impact that we collectively um, can really all embrace U360 across all of our funded contracts. I think our Commonwealth will look really different because very similar to what Pat talked about. Massachusetts has the lowest teen birth rate in the nation. However, when you begin to look at the disparities between racial groups, the inequities that are really highlighted, um, let us know that it's more than just the individual level intervention. We need individual level interventions, so what? Really to push people beyond. Mm -hmm. Well, and Stephanie, I think what's what's so unique with, with you providing the funding behind that and, and enforcing at, at that task level, we, and many of us are familiar with having to have that funding attached to the task level, the partnerships and establishing those partnerships and, and supporting that at that it's a requirement of your funding, as Lisette said, it, it takes time and, and recognizing that it takes time, but that's important, uh, that's so critical. Well, I think it's twofold, right? I, I often joke, um, you know, we're one of the states that have the, the good fortune of having a state funded program in addition to federal funds. So I think that um, it's, a, it's a major shift some of our providers are going through as well. One, in embracing the frame and learning how to talk about it and really being able to um, operationalize this on the local level. It's gonna be really important over the next couple of months, how we talk about it, how we roll it out in our kickoff meeting in August. So um, I'm not seeing any more questions. Uh, I'm going to uh, start to wrap it up, but if you do have other questions in the in the live chat, please do feel free to to share. Um, or Lisette and Stephanie, at, at this point, is there anything you want to add or or come back to? Um, just I guess I, I would. Oh, go ahead. I would uh, add, thank you. I would add just from sort of a practical, like strategic sort of perspective or um, from that place, um, just a, a few tips. Um, I would say don't be afraid to move outside of the evidence based box in the work that you do. Um, I think it's important to do what makes sense for your community and to 
um, address the needs that the young people have. We do we do great work, and there's a ton of um, federal funding around sort of this evidence-based work, and it's important, and we have outcomes. But um, I think that um, you know we really need to challenge ourselves to be able to kind of work outside of that and to be creative, and to um, to come up with solutions that um, maybe may look a little bit different, but that really makes sense for for the community. Um, and then um, um, I would say. Work is hard and you often don't see the payoff um, right away. Um, it takes a long time for people to sort of catch on. And so I think it's important to share the successes along the way. Um, and um, let's see. Um, I think it's also important to kind of give it all you have, but allow yourself to kind of let things go and don't take things personally in this in this work. Um, we have come up with a lot of really great ideas. Um, you know, as, as a coalition, but there are some initiatives and, and things that just didn't, that didn't stick, that people weren't excited about, that didn't get any momentum behind them. And so um, we've had to, you know, be really flexible and kind of shift gears and um, try other things. So so being sort of creative, um, looking at the data comprehensively um, was really important to us and to, to allow you to sort of see the whole picture, to see a youth as a whole person, to see what else is going on in their lives. I think, you know, we focus very heavily on the birth rates and all of the important data that that is related to the work that we're doing, I and mean, that's what we report on. Um, but but it's important to kind of see the bigger picture. And um, one example that I'll share of that is when we were preparing to apply for our first comp competitive prep grant, um, we uh, were looking at sort of what um, adulthood preparation topics we might want to incorporate. And pulled out our youth risk behaviors um, survey and looked at the data and said, okay, what else is going on in our young people's lives? And we saw um, a lot of uh, data that was pointing to uh, mental health issues um, among our youth. Um, high rates of suicide ideation, depression. This was a really big issue that was just kind of screaming at us. And so we thought, how can we incorporate some interventions and some work um, into sort of our application and, and to pair that with our, um, you know, our teen pregnancy prevention programs. Um, and so we um, started to have conversations with community partners and talked about the work that they were doing. And um, at that time, we decided to propose a, a yoga mindfulness component with our program where youth would um, participate in sort of physical movement, but also mindfulness techniques, learning how to sort of calm their minds, how to uh, manage stress. And, and that's something that we've been able to incorporate for you know the past um, five or more years, so um, that's just sort of one example of us kind of stepping back and looking at sort of the bigger picture and um, partnering with with other folks in the community who were doing this work um, and thinking about how we could kind of do it together. And with the grant, it was a great opportunity um, in terms of what they were requiring us to do, and also just that there would be some funding available for us to kind of pilot um, some work like this. Thank you, Lisette. I don't know if you saw it, um, but we, we have a common great tips. If there ever was a time for out of the box thinking, now is it. Uh, and I really appreciate your emphasis on that it's, it's not just about evidence-based, but there's a combination of thinking outside of the box or innovation. And evidence-based isn't restricted to this idea of evidence-based program or evidence-based intervention, but it's just like you said, it's it's using the data and looking not just at those sexual risk behaviors, but other, and what do we have about mental health? So thank you for that. Um, Stephanie or Pat, did you have anything you wanted to add? I mean, I think Lisette said it best, right? Um, do not be restricted to evidence-based programs. I think our field has done a really good job of kind of beating folks over the head on to use the EBI, use the EBI. Um, and we know that EBIs are not actually really inclusive in meeting all the needs of young people with the intersections of their identities. Um, and so I think it's important and it's our responsibility to really push back and I was not always a funder, so I will say as someone, mm -hmm. it's important to push your funder and hold us to the fire. If your funder is not talking about a whole young person, you can have a conversation about that. Um, so I encourage folks, if you are getting funding from different places, to raise that question. Thank you, Stephanie. Pat, did you? So one thing I was going to say, because somebody asked a question about the Youth Advisory Councils earlier, and I, I want to say that I think it's really important that 
engage youth in thinking about this work always. And I think that engaging them in thinking about the whole Youth360 approach is really important. I mean, you could have youth-led environmental scans where they go out and walk neighborhoods and map, you know, things like safe space and food deserts and those kinds of things. And it will be very obvious to young people and they can be their own best advocates for the things that they see that are lacking in their neighborhoods that would improve their health and well-being, including their sexual health and well-being. Well being. Uh, so I think that youth can be a really important part of recognizing and um, advocating for a more holistic approach to, to meeting their needs. Thank you, Pat. Um, and, and thank you, Lisette and Stephanie, and for all of all of you who joined us in this event. Um, we are going to be ending the broadcast now, uh, but this will be available on our YouTube channel so that if you want to share the experience, uh, you can just send people to our YouTube channel. Uh, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, my email is Gina, G-I-N-A, at HealthyTeenNetwork.org. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. you. Too. Bye. Thank you.